So my first show had like 450, 500 people paid. Fucking insane. It was addicting, man. It was so packed and uh, <laughs> we were so fucking lucky. I mean, nobody had been, nobody had done it. It was like a high school party gone stupid. And we played all originals of bullshit grunge metal. It's terrible. The singer um, ended up getting sent away to military school right after his parents were so pissed he was in a band and all of his poetry was suicidal or whatever. But but for one epic night, it was awesome. Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, brought to you by Sound Talent Media, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians to talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. I hope you had a glorious weekend. I most certainly did. This Vox and Hops episode is presented by Heavy Montreal. Heavy Montreal is Montreal's premier metal promoter. They put on a bunch of sick metal shows throughout the year, but they also put on one of North America's best metal festivals and that's the absolute truth and now that the pandemic seems to be subsiding a little bit and we are allowed to start organizing shows again heavy montreal has done just that they've announced ginger and suicide silence coming in the fall they've also announced all them witches they have also announced bloodbath coming up next year in 2022 you can get your tickets for all of those events via the link in the description of this podcast but right now what they're doing is that they are presenting Voivod's Hypercube Session 2, where they will be playing their classic influential album, Nothing Face, in its entirety. Uh, right after the live stream ends, there is an exclusive after party, which is hosted by yours truly and Zach Blair of Rise Against. You can get tickets to this event right now. It's also via the link in the description of this podcast. It's going to be an absolute blast. All of this is happening this coming Sunday on May 30th. The live stream event starts at 4 p.m. and then the exclusive after party, which I will be hosting, will be starting at 5.15 EDT. It's going to be an absolute blast. Before we jump into today's episode, I would just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I'm also asking you to rate it and write a review. Why do I want you to do that? It's because when you rate and write a review for a podcast, it will help other people, other metalheads, just like yourself, discover the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. Because when they are looking for a new podcast to listen to, what do they do? They scroll down, they read the reviews, and if those reviews reflect their interests, things that they love, they will most probably give that podcast a chance. So when you write a review, you could actually be the person that helps sway someone become a new Vox and Hops head. And that would be something that I would truly, truly appreciate. Now, on today's episode, I'm with Mike Schleibaum of Darkest Hour, Zealot RIP, and Be Well. Get ready, everyone. This is a banger of an episode, and it's Vox and Hops episode number 266. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today I'm with Mike Schleibaum of Darkest Hour, Zealot R.I.P. He is also the producer in the Riff Dojo. I love it. I love it. Mike, how are you doing? I'm good. It's a Saturday over here, and I'm having a tasty red stripe with you because I think this is some kind of beer-themed uh, podcast. Uh, I do so many, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. But hopefully, <laughs> otherwise, uh, I'm just going to drink a beer. It is an absolutely a beer theme podcast. Vox and Hops is all about hanging out with my metal friends, talking about their life, music, and craft beer. So, so let's just dive straight into it. Let's talk about beer. Uh, you're drinking a red stripe on my side. I'm drinking something brand new, super cool from up here Whoa. in Montreal. This is from Silo. They are in. They don't fuck around. They don't do any fucking hype beers. They hate the haze. They don't do pastry stouts. What they do love is classic beer styles. And this is a first in Quebec. It's a lager beer, and it's a first in Quebec because it has a very special yeast in it, the Tum 35, and it's uh, widespread in Franconia. This is a Franconian-inspired um, 
lager, uh, which is from the north of Bavaria in Germany. I haven't had it yet. I've seen killer reviews going on the minimalist can art, as usual, with Silo. I'm going to crack this. Mike, tell me about your very first beer. Hey, well, first I want to ask about, uh, is that, uh, is, what's the alcohol content on that bad boy? Uh, 5% ABV. Oh, see, I like that. God, I hate these ones that are, that are the new ones that are insanely high. It's like, oh, it's too much, man. But, uh, uh, mm, mm. I do have a red stripe, so I didn't know I had to go so classy with y'all, but I should have, <laughs> should have, uh, this is just what happened to be in the, in the dojo. I, I actually prefer whiskey to beer, but, uh, my first beer was at my bachelor party around 30 and, it was a warm Budweiser. And, you know, really? to, this, to this day, I still kind of like, you know, I, I actually like Budweiser. It's very uh, nostalgic tasting. I like light beers. I like I, I, I like cheap beers. I also do like some of the fancy stuff. But um, I started on the old original USA Budweiser. <laughs> why, why at the age of 30? See, that's a, that's well, a- I pres- an answer. Well, I prescribed to the vegan straight edge for a very long time in my life. Um, I still think that that whole philosophy is like, you know, pretty healthy for a lot of people. But me, I tend to do better when I embrace um, the middle road rather mm-hmm. than, you know, the extremes on either side, if you will. So um, at some point in my life, I decided that I, w- I no longer identified as that and I was going to experiment a little bit. But that was pretty late on and uh there wasn't really like a safe place for me to do that at that age really until you know we were having a, a bachelor party which is kind of like a this, this, you know budget way of breaking and drinking but also kind of cool so whatever so uh yeah we got drunk it was we got drunk on warm Budweiser and a couple Mike's hard lemonades at my bachelor party and then it took me a long time before I like could appreciate the difference between just getting drunk and drinking any beer, you know, mm-hmm. and I had a much later timeline than people because I started drinking much later in my life than a lot of people. So, um, you know, I think my tastes are somewhere around a college freshman right around now. <laughs> well, you, you didn't. No, oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to turn that off. That's fine. That means drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it won't last too long. <laughs> mm. God damn it. It's one second. I apologize. <laughs> no. Drink. I'm drinking with you, people. This is a Jamaican lager beer. Red Stripe. Y'all don't know about it. Y'all better find out about it. Because, man, it's goddamn good. That has literally never happened before. And I've done 260 of these. So That's fine. <laughs> I recorded you a Red Stripe commercial while you're away. So. <laughs> Perfect. I love that. that. That reminds me of the time when I, I was doing an interview with the boys from Conjurer. And I had to pee in the half of it. And I went to go pee. And this was outside. We were in the back of the Corona Theater in Montreal. And uh, the whole time I was peeing, I didn't know that they were doing a play-by-play. And I only realized that when I edited the episode afterwards. Mm-hmm. Stumbling in the bushes. <laughs> he got stuck in the burrs. That's awesome. <laughs> but later in life, yeah. So, so you didn't miss anything, though. That's for sure. You didn't miss all those, you know, silly hangovers, those, those horrible I mean- 20s. I still got those, you know, just later, but yeah, no, I I appreciate the, where the healthy living got me, you know, uh, to the point where I could party in my later years. You know what I mean? Because now at least you're at at a more mature mindset where, and the people around you, I assuming were a bit older as well and had nobody's mature (laughs) at all. Like that I'm around, no one is mature. And, um, uh, that wouldn't be we 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 were absolutely we're we were absolutely and still are probably too reckless with our drinking but you know again i said we're, we're like sort of in the freshman college era some of us I mean, at least me and some of the other guys are trained professionals so i don't think anything we do is responsible personally were you all on the vegan straight edge train or were no you, it was just like a mix of you guys i was hanging on at the end for sure okay this is killer. This is uh, it tastes like Bavaria. It's awesome. light, crispy. Yeah. 
Uh, I love. I'm a big fan of ready. Hellas, the style yeah. Hellas beer. Yeah. you know what I mean. That which is why, like which Hellas. is why DC Brow and you guys hooked up. But I, we'll we'll get there. I want to cover that for sure. I definitely want to call, cover the saber, the swill. But we'll make our way there. <laughs> Let's talk about 2020, the year that is now behind us. How did you cope with the glorious year of 2020, which is now behind us? Uh, well, I'm pretty grateful that I have the the dojo. You know what I mean. I made the move. Mm-hmm a long time ago to basically get rid of the studio that I had that was out of my house and sort of separate church and state, if you will. And I just brought the rock and roll to the house, which is uh, problematic in a sense that I have a 10 year old. So sometimes those things, they cross paths in a strange way, but she's well adjusted. So, you know, having a death metal basement probably isn't that big of a deal, (laughs) but, um, we moved all of our operations as Darkest Hour pretty much here uh, once I moved up to Maryland, uh, right outside of DC where the dojo is. And we just used to store everything and really cut the expenses of the band down. Um, and not everybody even lives in the area. So sometimes we use this as the place that we rehearse and sometimes we'll like to go somewhere that's uh, bigger, you know? But uh, what, what I'm getting at is I'm very lucky to have this space, to be all by myself, continue to work on the band, uh, pivot from being able to tour to having to market on the internet and do interviews like this. And uh, we have been running a Patreon, uh, which we started, if anybody doesn't know, it's kind of like, it's an internet subscription service, like a monthly thing, like a software uh, program sometimes do now, or like your Netflix only it's for darkest hour and we've been doing awesome stuff like making records i have them behind me that we're hand numbering and sending to people you know as we drink and uh it's pretty cool we've never done anything like this and all the records are limited and different colors and um so we sort of like created our own uh well yeah in a sense created our own record label where we've done three limited vinyl releases a bunch of wall flags t-shirts all through this uh, website and kind of made a stronger connection with a whole bunch of really energized people who love Darkest Hour. And they've actually been helping us fund album 10 as we've been creating it basically here and over the internet. But recently, as in as recently as uh, yesterday, <laughs> we've been working on uh, stuff here with John, our singer, who he isn't here right now because I'm doing the interview, but uh, he's been helping me pack up stuff. And so uh, the long, that's a long answer for what have you been doing, which is basically like existing as a band over the internet until we can go back to touring, which we now have a set end date. You know, we are have a set show September 26th. So we're nice. coming back to the stage. And I think uh, having that has helped push through the last, you know, several months for sure, knowing it's- that there's something to prepare for and whatever it's what we need. It's, it's like when you, you know, when you're on an airplane and you're watching that little graph going, you know, we go to Japan, let's say, and you get past that halfway mark and it's, it just feels so good when you can see the end, the end, the yeah. end of the tunnel. <laughs> also, Why don't we you do ca- something special, do something special and number that vinyl on this Vox and Hops episode right now and write something special so that whoever well, gets I that. I can't thing. because they're all boxed. Those are boxed ah, up. Okay. I got to go get one over here, but hold on. I can get one. What I, what I was going to say Oh, yeah. I can show you all what it is, but first, I have to get a pen so we can do this properly. Yes, no worries. Who knows? Somebody's going to get the box and hop special. Exactly. And then they'll go back and they can watch this episode and see it happen in real life and know that it's actually you guys that are doing it, not some oh, kid oh, that you're we're, we're, we're definitely doing, like, we're doing all this stuff ourselves. Like, we got a little traced high five from our lead singer in here. That's amazing. Um, and the cool <laughs> thing about these records is that, th- so they're all hand numbered. What do we got here? 88. That's, a That's correct. One. All right. So pull it out. Right. I'm going to write on it. But the cool thing about these is they're all different colors. So you never know what you're going to get. And this one is a super cool, like dark blue kind of swirl. Gorgeous. Which is Gorgeous. Cool. Um, this oh. is basically, oh, you said, what did we do during the uh, pandemic? Well, we made a live stream concert, which is something we'd never done before. And uh, 
we basically went down to our club, our favorite club in DC called the Black Cat. And uh, we went and we were supposed to have an awesome anniversary show there, a 25th anniversary mm. show. But that got canceled thanks to the pandemic. And so we went down there anyway and recorded a live stream concert that then we went and put on the internet and uh, used all the proceeds to then donate back to the club. And uh, we raised like over $6,000 doing that. Then did a restream and made a bunch of th uh, thousands of dollars for clubs all over the, the U.S., who were, uh, you know, affected by the pandemic because we had canceled the tour with Misery Signals. So yeah, after yeah. we did all that, uh, it, 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 it included a whole bunch of guests. Like you can see here, we have a bunch of guest guitar players, our friends, because all over the, the world, we use the powers of the internet to get them on this record. So then in the end, this came out so good. Like it sounded so good. We were like, we got to we gotta do something with that. So we decided we would bring it into the... Uh, limited vinyl record series and press it up and uh this is our third vinyl release and um it's record 88 i'm gonna write vox and hops on the old numbers right here awesome i love it <laughs> and so it's one day somebody will be like what's that and i'm we'll google it, it and then they'll see this and they know that it's happening right now so look sick mike you can see but it's i wrote uh uh, it's kind of hard to see because it's black it's on there. black yeah, we got Metallica it, yeah. style, dude. I wrote uh, <laughs> Vox and Hops, and then I wrote 2021 and autographed it, man. So, uh, yeah, this is going to go in a package along with all of the other records that are behind me, and they're going to get sent to all of our happy Patreons. And there's 66 left, so if anybody's watching this and they're like, damn, well, you can still maybe get in there because we got 66 spots left before these are sold out, and then we keep doing it. And we're working on new music and i ain't saying that's exactly how we're gonna put it out but these people are definitely going to get hooked up with something that's for sure they got it yeah you know, that's the hardest thing with the patreon is to feed the machine man now you're making me work i gotta drink again Shit. <laughs> i always make my guests work let's talk about you growing up the soundtrack of your youth when you were growing up in your parents or guardians house what music was playing when you were not in control of the radio what music did your parents or guardians listen to nothing Really, my 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 mother was very uh, religious. She was a mm. Catholic nun uh, for ten years, for a decade. Before, uh, instead of taking her final vows, she decided to leave the convent, travel to D.C., become a, a school teacher, and meet my father, who was an ex-Vietnam vet. And they uh, got together, and he liked music. He liked uh, actually a lot of surf rock, like Dick Dale. Um, and he also liked uh, Dwayne Eddy, who's another surf rock guitarist. He liked a lot of Western, country Western stuff like, um, let me think, uh, Hank Williams Jr., you know what I mean? And um, just kind of off the wall stuff that you'd be like, a kind of irreverent, irreverent country, if you will. <laughs> and he also liked, uh, he didn't like much classic rock, is what I'm getting at. He, he had, uh share in his record collection which is weird uh but we never had music uh if there was any record that he actually ever listened to it would have been um uh born in the usa by bruce springsteen was like maybe the only music that the you know um so for me i didn't discover music till i left the house and uh i started playing ice hockey and I started being kind of around an ice rink all the time. And a lot of people at ice rinks listen to heavy metal. And at ice rink is where I first was exposed to the Metallica Black record. And it is also where I met my friends who at their houses, I got to watch MTV. And that's also where I found, found heavy metal music. So then once that happened, I got into a lot of classic rock and a lot of classic heavy metal that I would have to listen to with like my headphones on because we were a no music house. For sure. You, you couldn't have it playing in your room. Fuck no. Are you kidding me? In fact, my mom would find stuff and throw it away repeatedly. Like no she would throw way. away my Aussie shit. She would throw away, man, she hated Carcass because of that, uh, the eye on the, yeah. I think it's heart work. Man, mm. she threw that away and she left me a note about how bad it was, which pissed me off. Um, so uh, I had this spot at my house where I would hide all my records because I mean, I had the jump in the fire uh, tape cassette demo because there was a music store near me where they it was like a used record and tape traders. 
that was near the ice rink so I could walk there and I could buy mm. stuff and my parents didn't know about it because you, 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 you were at, you were at, at the ice rink yeah and uh so I would hide my records and I definitely I remember hiding that jump in the fire cassette because man it has a fucking devil like right on it you know what I mean like <laughs> shit but uh after a while my parents had more kids and they couldn't pay attention to me that much and what happened was although I liked heavy metal uh and a lot of my influences like that my early formative music is like your classics metallica pantera van halen slayer megadeth you know what i mean but i also at the same time met friends at school who were into the vegan straight edge movement of the mm -hmm. early 90s and so these bands became more of my heroes because i could go see them live and so they were like earth crisis Snapcase. Bloodlet, Damnation AD, Undertow, Unbroken, like 90s, uh, Victory Records, Hardcore, the first generation, you know, Integrity, like uh, Shelter. Uh, these bands would come play and they would, they're, what, what, the thing was all the people that drank and partied never could do anything. They could never play a show or promote anything. They just sat around at band practice and didn't do shit. And my vegan straight edge friends were going all around the East Coast playing VFW halls and weird places that people were setting up. And so I was addicted to that right away. And so that became part of my, that subculture along with the music became as much as uh, the beginning DNA of my musical journey as classic heavy metal that a lot of people also enjoy. That's amazing. I saw in another interview, your parents have never seen Darkest Hour. Is that still true to this day? Well, yeah. Well, my father passed away, uh, oh. so he won't ever see Darkest Hour, but I, he was well, slightly more supportive than my mom. But yeah, my mom's not into it, and I think it's fine uh, because uh, I, as now being a parent, I'm like, man, I can't imagine if my daughter did something that I thought was as stupid <laughs> as heavy metal to my mom, so... <laughs> eh, fuck it. <laughs> you know, also, uh, you know, our art, I like to keep our art super, like, keep it real with Darkest Hour. And I don't need that shadow of my mom's judgment coming in there, even though at, in my 40s, I could give a shit. I used that fuel a lot when I was younger, you know, for music. I think a lot of the way a lot of people do who whose parents don't connect with them about their love for heavy metal or music or anything in general. So, uh, but now that I'm older, you know, I realize I was pretty tough on my mom at times. And so, you know, you kind of get some perspective and you're like, I'm pretty lucky to be where I'm at and whatever. But uh, it was good to have a little bit of uh, fuel to dedicate my life to this. Cause man, if she didn't hate it so much, I probably wouldn't have loved it this much. <laughs> <laughs> I came from a completely different household where they were completely supportive, you know, like jamming in my bedroom, that story, my dad sleeping while we're practicing because he liked the rumble of the bass, completely different. So kudos to you for, for using that to fuel you to keep going to push you further. Yeah, well, my daughter has a much different, she'll have a much different interview when she's older. She'll be like, yeah, it was like stupid. It's like every day there's somebody coming over. They're always playing music. There's guitars every day. There, I open the door. There's some delivery for something. Mm -hmm. It's always got somebody over there, and they all smell down there. And then they all <laughs> they're always leaving their beer bottles and cigarette butts all around the garage and over at the deck. And you know, I like music, but I don't like heavy metal. I like you know, she, my daughter, what, likes whatever, whatever she there. likes, yeah. you know. And so. <laughs> Who Either way, I like. know that when she hears uh, you know, certain songs, like I know that she knows the lyrics to UFO, Doctor Doctor. Like I heard him sing, a, I heard her sing it one time, so I know I'm doing my job. That's correct. <laughs> Let's talk about your first show. Do you remember the very first show that you went to see? Well, uh, there was again a few formative moments because there's several different styles of shows that I saw that really brought me to my love for music i mean first there was my first heavy metal concert which i had a friend who had won a tickets to see metallica mm. at the uh capital center in maryland uh and he won four tickets and it was like a limo ride there and back because you're supposed to drink but he won on the radio and we don't drink so it was perfect for a bunch of kids in like eighth grade because we were chauffeured there 
So cool. And um, so I went to see the Metallica Black Record concert where just Metallica, they put on the little skit before the show on the thing. They had the snake pit, you know, and uh, it was awesome. It was terrifying because we were young and uh, the people around us were like older Metallica fans and they were really <laughs> into it. And uh, it was right when Metallica was breaking into like being a rock band, but they still had legit metal fans. And we were there. We didn't have one piece of heavy metal anything on us. We were in eighth grade. But it was fucking awesome. That show, I mean, come on. Metallica on the Black Record live is, it, it was electric. I mean, after that, I was writing songs and trying to record them on the little tape recorder and doing anything I could. I mean, I was Googling or doodling band names on my sketch. Everything, you like, after you see Metallica like that, you're like, I want to be playing heavy metal. I mean, I'd already seen uh, ACDC all over the place on MTV doing concerts and in, in, in mosh pits, but to witness it, and even though uh, Metallica, by the way, at the Capitol Center didn't have an actual mosh pit. It was seated, mm. right? Whole, even the snake pit. The snake pit wasn't, but we were far from there. We were yeah. like in a seated arena, but everybody stood up and they headbang, they did whatever, but it was very, it was very policed, you know, it was very mm. tame. Uh, so, uh, I had also become addicted to VHS tapes. So we would watch like, now that we knew who Metallica was, we would watch like Kill 'Em All, uh, Cliff 'Em All, I mean, we'd watch the videotapes and we would uh, the also really influential videotape was the Sepultura videotape where it's like live. Uh, it's not, it's live in Spain. They play at the Razzmatazz. Uh, and I, we Darkest Hours played at this club, but I used to watch this video over and over. And I mean, it was fucking sick, like Sepultura in their prime, you know, moshing. Like I wanted to be in a mosh pit, you know, and it wasn't until I saw uh, the bands Unbroken and Undertow were from Seattle and one is from uh, California. They're hardcore straight edge bands that were traveling, doing a tour and they came to DC and I was in high school. Now I had fallen in love with heavy metal, but I didn't know about hardcore and hardcore is a lot different you know, and I didn't know anything about the culture, didn't know anything. So my first hardcore show was at a place called the Chamber of Sound in Washington, D.C. It's very famous for having a lot of these shows. It was in 1992, I believe it was, might have been or might have been 94. Um, but it was right around then. And that was super crazy because I had seen at this point, I had seen uh, Pantera live with a real mosh pit. I'd seen Metallica. I'd seen some things when you see like a hardcore mosh pit, it's like people climbing over each other and singing along and doing all sorts of other kind of moshing and it's fucking crazier, right? And then that was, so I can pinpoint it to Metallica Black Record concert, Undertow and Unbroken Live at the Safari Club. And the last puzzle that came together was uh, the, our local heroes, the biggest band from Washington DC probably ever is a band called Fugazi. And they would play for every uh, summer in the park, this place called Fort Reno. And uh, that's where all the punks ended up. All the vegan, hardcore, straight edge kids, all the uh, kids that were into Discord, all the kids that were into ska, all the kids that were into anything, this is where they all came together. And that's where I was introduced to a whole other realm of music and guitar and things that could happen, you know? And that really broke it open because first it was complete boys club macho kind of thing to be into heavy metal and then hardcore it was different people were talking about social issues and it and not every, everybody was talking more about working out than they were talking about getting fucked up and playing shows right and then i got to a, a fugazi show and there were just people different types of people that liked all different types of things and it was like wow you can go on tour and do these punk shows and have people from all different types of places come. And all you have to do is pass out flyers and connect with the people locally. Like mm -hmm. it isn't about trying to be Metallica. It's a, it's about how do you have a show like Fugazi, you know? And so uh, those three concerts uh, are, we're all like, are all pretty famous are all videotaped in some way, which is cool. Cause I found them. So to be able to not only tell you about these concerts, but go see a video of them, 
on the day they were happening is pretty cool. And they still I mean? stand up and they still stand up to your members. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Talk to me about your first time on stage. My first time on stage. I'm trying to think. Uh, first time on stage. I've got to think of my first actual. Okay, so. Um, all right. I had a band called WD40. Mm-hmm. My first band. Okay. This was my first band. Uh, we had a demo, uh, and it was supposed to be called Penny in the Gutter, but there was a misprint on the demo, and it was called Penny in the Butter. Okay, it was not good. <laughs> but no, we were that, that was we a horrible, were, horrible band. Meeting. But we were really, really young, like fourteen. Man, wow. I don't think I could drive yet. And uh, our drummer, who I'd found in school through like a thing that somebody had put on a wall. <laughs> you know, yeah. like posted up on a wall. Yeah, yeah. His dad owned a local music store. So he could get us in to have some recording time. But his dad didn't want us to record like super heavy stuff. So we recorded a bunch of like, uh, uh, kind of like lighter, kind of like, uh, not jazzy, but just lighter bullshit. Versions. Bullshit. And then we also recorded the WD-40 demo at the same time and like didn't tell his dad. Then made tape cassettes, <laughs> fucked up the name, Penny and the Butter, the tape cassettes born. And we would go around school and we would pass these around. And so I had mentioned to you about how I fell in love with Fugazi. Well, I met these kids at school who were doing a band called Frodus. And Frodus mm-hmm. went on to be actually a really cool band that put out some records on Tooth and Nail. Their last record where when we watched we washed our rep- weapons into the sea on tooth and nail is, is incredible. Okay. So this band that I'm talking to you about started as a high school band, like WD 40 went on to be really good. And their demo was way better than WD 40. But anyway, we met them, the band Frodis, we became friends with them and they said, we have to play a show. And one of the guys in my band, he went to church all the time and they would let us use their hall Mm -hmm. to have a show, right? So we went to our buddies in Frodus, and we were like, dude, let's have a show. And they had been playing around at these local music stores and actually had, uh, you know, kind of told people about the band, you know, told people about their band, and they'd had, they played music talent shows. That's how I'd met them. I went to a talent show, but somebody pulled the fire alarm before they could play, so they didn't play. So I just... I met them outside because their drummer was beating the shit out of his car with a baseball bat. He was so pissed <laughs> off they didn't play. And I was like, these guys got to I got to meet these guys. And it was funny, totally digressing, but this is an awesome part of the story. These guys set up in a gym. It was a talent show and they were going to play and they never, ever had double bass ever in the band. But, but the guy, the drummer could play. No, no. I mean, they couldn't play double bass. They never had even double kick in the in the band, but the drummer could play double kick at the time. And when he set up, he played a bunch of double kick. And that was the thing in high school. If you could play double kick, shit, you I, you wanted to be in a band <laughs> with that guy. He set up his kit, played a little bit of double kit, kick, and then somebody pulled the fire alarm. He went outside, beat the shit out of his car with a baseball bat, and I became instant friends with him. So we put on this idea to put on a show at our, and we got our, roped in our buddy to let us use this church hall. And then we proceeded to make flyers and put them in every motherfucker's locker in every high school around us, like four or five high schools. We went to everyone and slipped it in the thing. I mean, you could get arrested for that shit now, but (laughs) nobody said anything because it was at a fucking church. Mm. So my first show had like 450, 500 people paid fucking insane. Frodo's headline, we played right before them. It was addicting, man. It was so packed and uh, <laughs> we were so fucking lucky. I mean, nobody had been, nobody had done it. It was like a high school party gone stupid. And we played all originals. Amazing. We played all originals of bullshit grunge metal. It's terrible. The <laughs> singer um, ended up getting sent away to military school right after his parents were so pissed he was in a band and all of his poetry was suicidal or whatever. But, but for one epic night, it was awesome. And then the band fell apart. Like I told you, mm-hmm. the, the singer got shit sent away. And uh, then the drummer of the band, his dad was a music store owner and he was pissed that his kid was spending time doing this shit. So like, 
I drifted more and more apart from everybody and started another band called Indivision. And that band started playing locally at these hardcore shows. And that band also broke up because everybody had a falling out. But through that band, I met the singer of Darkest Hour. And we started Darkest Hour together uh, right after that band fell apart. And our first show happened to be on September 23rd, uh, um, was September 23rd, 1995. And it was a sick ass fucking show with Damnation AD, Battery um, at this church, also at a church hall. And there was also six, 700 people at that show. And uh, that sort of began the story of Darkest Hour. And it was through multiple failures, you know what I mean? And that first night at the fucking Knollwood Church down there in Burke, Virginia. That's still there, by the way. Amazing. So many killer first gigs. And out of everyone I've spoken to, it's always a shitty first gig, but you're one of the ones that had a two good first Dude, gigs. Dude, fucking amazing. stupid, man. Hey, trust me, I've had a lot of <laughs> shitty gigs now, though. I'll- I bet I'll put mine on the board, dude. I've been the, I've been through the ringer. Like you step up the plate, you're gonna make a lot of strikes. But um, <laughs> every once in a while, <laughs> we we were tied in. You know, it was different before the internet. Like um, you really really only took a couple of really uh, motivated people to make something special happen. And now I I, I feel like it is sort of harder to cut through. But man, oh, when we were high so school, so oversaturated. We were high schools. We did fun shit like that. And that was the first gig. This is a Heavy Montreal Presents Vox and Hops episode. So I want to talk about your memories, experiences, a cool story, something about Montreal. Oh, what fuck. You, just only one thing? Poutine. <laughs> that's, that's, Poutine. A cop, that's, a cop, that's a cop out. Are you, <laughs> well, I'm not from there. So have you ever checked it out? It's fucking sick. Harvey's. Dude, that veggie burger is killer. Dude, Tim Hortons, what you got to do is you got to get the fruit explosion muffin, but you got to get them to warm it up in the microwave for like 30 minutes mm-hmm. or 30 seconds. And then also the double, double, that's the way I like my coffee, two sugars, two creams. You got to learn the, the lingo, mm-hmm. but it's changed, man. Last time I was at Tim Hortons, man, quality levels gone way down. Burger didn't King. have, Burger didn't have King, the egg Burger salad sandwich. That's Burger the King. problem, yeah. dude. You know, <laughs> anyway, uh, listen, we're Canadian. I mean, I know we're not Canadian because we live in Washington, D.C., which is the capital of the USA or whatever, but we have done two records in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. We have toured cross Canada twice as a band, which not a lot of people have done no. once. Ever. No, 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 no. We have played Western Canada a bunch. We played uh, Alberta, Edmonton, Regina, you know what I mean? Thunder Bay. I played Thunder Bay like four times in my life, you know? Yep. Not to, to mention all the fucking times we played all around uh, Toronto. Cause you mm-hmm. got like Guelph, you got all that shit up in there. And then a uh, Kingston, Ontario probably played there three or four. Times. I don't know how many people have played Kingston, Ontario more I than haven't. twice or th- well, I've I never, have I've played never there played four that. times. It's awesome. And also Ottawa all. The, so, but let's talk about Montreal, which is sick, which is always, you know, I think La, I'm going to tear, I'm going to fucking brutally destroy this name, but. La Fufus Electric, or how do you say Pretty it? Pretty close, Fufon Electric. Damn, I'm so American. The English people call it Fufus. I'm, I'm yeah. apologizing to all the French-speaking Canadians. You're the best. I, I'm under undereducated in the language department. But uh, I love this club especially. Mm-hmm. You know, have had some special nights there. But uh, have also had an amazing epic concert with the crown around the corner where the power went out because of some crazy riot. And really? a, a workers' rights riot, and then at the last minute, the power came on, and we and the us and the crown played in this warehouse, and it was epic. Um, uh, I've also been robbed several times in Montreal. Famously, had my all my clothes, and my gear stolen on the side of the trailer, like the, that that back alley right by yeah, the yeah, electric yeah. is totally, right behind folks. Yeah, no, you don't want to hang out. Brutal as yeah. fuck, dude. Um, but also, uh, I'll, I'll I'll tell you the 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 my favorite time probably would have been my first time because mm. it happened to be the first time that the children of Bodom ever played Canada really? and it was with cataclysm okay yeah. and it was right around uh 2000 it was it was like 
I'm telling you, it was the first time Bodum came to America. They were playing the Milwaukee Metal Fest, mm-hmm. and we were all touring out there. We were on tour with Destruction or something. It was an off day, and or maybe Destruction played straight up. Maybe, maybe uh, actually, it was probably Destruction, Cataclysm, Children of Bodum, Darkest Hour, and uh, Dying Fetus was on the tour, but Jesus, I'm not sure if they got into the border, but. If you've ever played this club that we're talking about, the method. backstage, the fucking backstage is very, uh, I'm talking about the electric. It's it's oh. very understated. It's upstairs. Mm-hmm. You go all the way upstairs to the third balcony or wherever the fuck it mm-hmm. is. And in the back, there's this curtain and then there's this two rooms and they stick everybody in there. And it's like, you walk down the stairs, around this thing, up these other stairs onto the stage. It's total bullshit. Okay. We get there. We get we get to this backstage room that's kind of shot and it is fucking packed with food. I mean, it's laid out and this we're on tour for like our first time. We're talking two thousands and ninety nine or whatever, and uh, we haven't seen a six spread, so we tore it up. I mean, we didn't know it wasn't for us. I mean, also we didn't know we weren't supposed to do that. And meanwhile, there's these little kids that are there. They're all in like hoodies and shit. They're sitting in the corner. I mean, I don't know. We think they're waiting for Destruction's autograph. And we're like, well, let's tear up this fucking deli tray before Destruction gets here because we know we're not <laughs> getting any as soon as they get here. And Cataclysm were super cool. They were they were kind of looking out for us. Uh, Maurizio, shout out to him. Uh, and Canadians everywhere because Maurizio uh, from Cataclysm always had our back. And so we weren't afraid of, that it was his. We knew he always wanted to share and was cool. But we didn't think about the fact that it might have been these little kids that were in the corner, right? Because who the fuck were they? And <laughs> so we introduced ourselves to them, and they all could speak uh, English pretty good. But they were obviously from, you know, Scandinavia. And we start talking to them some more, figure out where they're from for real. And uh, they start saying they're in children about them. And we're like, they look like children. And we're like, that's cool. And we never heard of them because we're metalcore whatever i mean we knew destruction was and we thought cataclysm was the death metal band and we knew who mm-hmm. dying fetus was they were from our town we just wanted to be on tour so uh we play we have a great show it was amazing i'm telling you montreal of canadian fans canadian heavy metal fans are the best they love it they're very cordial they want to see a great show they want to be involved they like quality metal they stick by their guns they stick around the music it becomes a lifestyle for them it was it was everything we wanted to be and we thought man good luck to these little kids they're supposed to play after us you know (laughs) and this might have been the first time that we were taught a lesson and we've been taught a lesson a lot of times and by a lot of great bands not just children of bodum uh just i'll shout out amon and marth parkway drive there's a few bands that have played with darkest hour who we had no idea who they were and we were uh, jockeying to be above them on the bill and children of Bodum, Bodum got higher because uh, a little bit known to us, they were fucking ginormous. Yeah. So the fucking keyboard player gets on the stage to put his stand up there after we were done playing and the whole place goes shit balls. Like I'm talking about Canadians losing their mind how they lose their mind and this dude was just setting up. Right? And we were like, what? And then Alexi got up there, mm-hmm. did the set. We heard Children of Bodom for the first time, the music live in, in our face, watched him perform when he was young and had everything to prove and watched that crowd eat it up. And it was fucking insane. And we were done. When they were done, we apologized to them for eating their deli trick. And it was <laughs> like, they were cool. They didn't even know it was for them. So they didn't say uh. anything. And, and and then we were just but like- they wouldn't dare touch it. And, they were like- <laughs> They didn't even know. They were just cool. They were humble and they were so excited to be there and they were nice. And also they were just sort of taking it in. And I appreciate that. They had probably played more than us. And they knew that the best thing to do when you're new is just wait, not Mm. tear up the deli tray and act like an asshole. And we didn't know any of that shit. (laughs) So uh, after that, they went and played the Milwaukee Metal Fest and we saw them, you know, there and they were super cool to us. And then we sort of lost track over time as they became uh you know mega rock stars but would see them occasionally we never actually toured with bodum or whatever maybe because of that tray but um uh they're an amazing band and them a lot like a monomarth a lot like parkery drive were, uh 
are just a few of the bands I can think of that surprised us. And that first night in Montreal, of course, you're never going to forget that. I mean, I could tell you about the time we played there with At The Gates on the Suicidal Final Tour. First time back in Canada over there since they broke up and how that go from Slaughter of the Soul yeah. just could have knocked that wall down when the whole room yelled it. Goosebumps everywhere. Yeah. Like, you know, but I think the Bodum story is better. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate both of those. That's excellent. And it is a good portrayal of uh, the passion of Montreal fans. Oh, you guys are the best. I need to get back there. Plus, everybody's so cool about weed and shit. They're just passing it around. Nobody's <laughs> tripping. You're all surprised when we don't want to mix it with tobacco. But everybody's just relaxed over there in Montreal. They want to see heavy metal guitars on point. You know what I mean? And they're ready to throw down. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's yeah, talk about there. Zealot R.I.P. You guys are dropping a record soon. Yeah, apparently. I hope these motherfuckers will get this shit out because we recorded it a while ago here at the dojo. But, uh, it's, it's coming out. I don't uh, want to throw Blake and Jason under the bus, <laughs> but I am. No, it's coming it's out. Coming out 3 one g There it is. Thank you, 3-1-G, for, for doing this because somebody needs to do it for Blake because he is a man who's screaming at the wall and we need to just point him in front of a mic. But uh, this band Zell at R.I.P. that I've been doing is one of many bands, but one that is special to me that I do that uh, I, I'm not saying I started, but I was beginning of the nucleus of um, based around the idea that I, outside of Darkest Hour, sometimes it's helpful to create with a different group of people or have something else that you're doing that maybe doesn't take the pressure. I mean, I've tried a lot of different strategies with my career. I've tried to focus on uh, just Darkest Hour and nothing else. I've tried to focus not on Darkest Hour and just let the opportunities come. Um, right now, I have uh, three active bands because I have another band called Be Well that is putting out a record on Revelation. So uh, why do I do all these bands? And it's like, well, really, in my 40s, it's a great way to connect with my friends and be creative uh, because um, that's basically what I'm doing all the time. You know, I don't really find a lot of joy in like going out uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to bars for no reason. Um, I usually just get punished somewhere, uh, you know, at the a corner of a bar or something. And I like going to shows and seeing bands. Don't get me wrong. I love hanging out with people, but I'm not like if, if there isn't a targeted reason to go to something, then I'd rather be here putting in work doing one of my many art projects. So it's a great way to connect with my friends. And so uh, with Jason, the drummer of Zealot, he and I have been friends for years, grew up. He was the drummer of Frodus, who I mentioned in mm -hmm. earlier stories. So he helped me put on my first fucking concert at this epic show that is the start of the story that we are at here. So we've remained friends and we've done a few other bands throughout the uh, our, our life, but you know, we wanted, I wanted to start a band that sort of leaned on his strengths, you know, because in other bands that he's been in, he's been kind of like really loud for the drum. I mean, even in Frodo's. I mean, I'm not throwing you under the bus, Jason. You're my best dude ever. But, you know, you allow personality for a drummer. Usually the singers like to be the personality. So I was like, I want to do a band where the shit goes off the rails. So we started jamming and it took us about 10 years. <laughs> and wow. we tried it with a whole bunch of other people. But... All these bands are intertwined because along the way I met, well, along the way we pulled in Mr. Peter from the band Fairweather. Peter Sosaurus, or however you say his last name, but he's my boy. And he's also in Be Well. And so mm. Peter is also in uh, the band Fairweather. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm throwing all these bands at you and whatever. But he starts coming over to jam with Zealot and all of a sudden he ends up in Be Well too because we're all hanging. But mm -hmm. as he joins Zealot, it starts to become like, kind of like a thing. We start uh, looking for singers. Now, I'm not quite sure if the timeline syncs up because I'm pretty sure that Peter joined before Blake, but it was around the same time. Um, because also what was happening is we had done a demo with another friend of ours um, who, who was also doing uh, another band. And she, she had done a great job of it. Um, but it didn't really like work out. So we we're kind of like, man, what can we do that like is really gonna make this thing just like insane, you know? And somehow Peter got involved and it was kind of starting to be a band. And then 
Blake somehow, and I can't pinpoint it either, although we know each other, uh, we know each other because he's in Pig Destroyer and I'm in Darkest Hour or whatever, but it wouldn't have occurred to me to like reach out to him and do a band with him. I mean, that is that connection is definitely Jason. I mean, definitely the connection to probably Peter is too, you know. Um, but however, these people in this chain of events actually were it's so convoluted because we all know each other so well, but how it became a band is maybe harder to pinpoint because of how organic like the relationships of people are. Um, but soon we had developed some songs. And I know it's weird to say, but like when you're hanging out with your friends and you're writing music, you're not, it's not so targeted. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So uh, whereas I had created Darkest Hour Records and uh, stuff like that and Be Well wasn't even a band. So I just, it just was doing Darkest Hour and Zealot. It was just something that was like happening. And then eventually we had these six songs, which are now coming out. And they were all recorded here at the dojo, re-recorded, recorded again, over and over again. Blake did vocals again. Blake did this. I mean, I don't know how many times we did shit. I can't even remember. I mean, I don't even know when you open up those sessions, like how crazy the whole thing came together, what's where. Because I really tried my best through the whole process to just unlearn everything I had learned about making a record because I wanted it to be visceral and disjointing and so different than a Darkest Hour record where I do want it to be driving in your face and punching, but I want it to be so uh, targeted with Darkest Hour that it's like a, a jackhammer and it can also have extreme melody. Whereas mm -hmm. Zealot, I, I again, I, I wanted to channel Jason's spirit of how he was almost so loud as his personality that it, it worked against him in other bands sometimes. I wanted to channel that here in a way to really accentuate it, but we needed a singer that fit that vibe. And when it all came together, like the goddamn A-Team, when they finally break Murdoch out of jail, Blake swoops in and he's kind of like the un front man because he's not super loud, but he's super funny and he's oh, yes. got a lot to say and his lyrics are super poetic. So it actually was the perfect combination because um, I think Blake does a good job of demanding the attention of this is legitimized. This is a man who's writing about his actual pain. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? And yep. where Jason, he's fun. You know, I mean, the reason that the band started is we're having fun, although we're writing dark music and we're making dark uh, critiques on the world through it. Uh, it is fun. You know, and so that how do you have that kind of witty juxtaposition? And I think it really is Nate, I mean, Blake and Jason, you know what I mean? And I think that uh, uh, having me and Peter in there sort of balance it out a little bit. And that kind of gave us this band that's a four piece and it's sort of like a metalized born against meets, uh, you know, hardcore or something, I would describe it. And the six songs are awesome. There's only three right now on uh, Spotify. And can I sum up this whole rant with, the most amazing thing about this shit is, Jason used to give me a fucking hard time about how Penny and the Butter was all spelled wrong, because it should have been Penny. I mean, he's, he loved it. But now we're in a band together and they fucked up Magnetic Field of Dreams on Spotify. And people no think way. it's Magnetic Fiend of Dreams. Well, that's actually a pretty good name, though. But, <laughs> but it's not the name. Hey, Penny in the Butter ain't bad, but it ain't Penny in the Gutter. <laughs> that's a bit, I'm excited for this. Um, do we have a release date, or is it still out there? I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm kidding a lot. Uh, but I think it's coming out in August, I hope. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, there's a whole lot of moving parts to uh, Blake's schedule, my schedule. Uh -huh. And I, again, um, with Zealot, especially with Zealot at any other project that I'm doing, um, really heavily influenced by, by Fugazi and this DC thinking where it is not in so much about commerce. Like you might not get to see Zealot. You definitely won't get to see De Zealot the way you see Darkest Hour touring mm -hmm. like that. If you have a chance to see this band, you need to see this band because when we accept the show, we know that 
we are going in there with the possibility of a lot of the gear breaking, somebody getting hurt, you know, and uh, the older you get, the more you have to pick those battles. So it's in some sense, it's performance art, but I don't think we'd want it any other way. And it doesn't make sense to a lot of people. And it might not make sense to a lot of my very excited heavy metal friends who also love the other projects I do, but that's okay because, you know, um, as an artist, sometimes you, you have to like scratch all over the paper and before you can start over and make a new drawing. So in some way, like the visceral release of doing uh, this project, Zealot, along with the other projects I do kind of balances me out to be hopefully a relatively normal human being and channel some of this creative energy I have that I don't know what to do with without punishing all my Darkest Hour bandmates 24 hours a day because I'm an intense motherfucker. Uh, the, the cathartic experience of creating extreme music is something that I cherish and uh, it's important. It's very, very important to, to use this energy that we have in a positive way. I mean, Even if it's, it's creating it, dark yeah. metal music. Well, it's hard too, because when you're dealing with music that becomes commerce, like mm -hmm. music that you end up selling, mm -hmm. you know, that, that becomes tricky. So I think with Zell It, that's what we really try to do is it really doesn't matter. Like all that matters is that this record does come out. I mean, I want it to come out in a timely fashion so that it doesn't cannibalize on some other shit that I'm doing. But in general, all that matters is that we, we made art as a group of friends and it's gonna come out and it's gonna be documented. And at some point someone's gonna find it at a record store and be like, what the fuck? And more importantly, at some point someone might come to one of the random shows we do play get spit on, get some gear thrown on, get bumped into and feel more alive. And then that's good too, you know? Absolutely. Let's talk about the DC Brow Darkest Hour beer. How did this happen? How did you guys get your own craft beer out on the market? The, the savor, the swill, the hells? Well, we love money, okay? Money <laughs> is awesome. Like, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if y'all know, but money is badass. So we got to sell shit to get money. But the problem is y'all don't want to buy music. So we have to keep coming up with random shit to sell people that isn't actually music occasionally to make this thing called money. So uh, we were sitting around drinking a bunch of beer, trying to figure out what the fuck do people want to buy? And after we ran out of beer and had to go buy more beer, we thought we should make a beer because... <laughs> People like to buy beer. And um, we started thinking, like, who should we make a beer with? And at the same time, uh, at this moment during the band's career, we were we had a manager. So mm -hmm. we were able to go to our manager and say, hey, we want to connect with a DC brewery and do something local. And so there are a lot of awesome breweries from here that are not DC Brow. You know, also Atlas Brewery is awesome. Mm -hmm. Three Stars Brewery is awesome. Um, but DC Brow... It happens to be the beer that I order when I'm going out and I'm trying to get fucked up, man, because the corruption is my jam. I should have had some here, but, you know, I don't like to bug those guys and go down there and get a whole bunch of free cases all the time. So I'm drinking Red Stripe. But when I'm out in the hood running around, I like to drink the corruption or I like to drink the red uh, DC Brow that they have. And so I don't know. I think that's maybe the Pilsner, but um, <clears throat> when it was a local brewery you know i'm not gonna I, i'm gonna be honest like dc brow's hustling they're over there they're making shit happen they got a little community a little warehouse uh it's really impressive what they're doing how they're tied in and they partnered with us uh, with us to do a few events and um do a whole bunch of fun stuff and they're really great people so it all sort of fell together and they were like let's make a beer and we told them we wanted a drinkable heavy metal party beer so that does not mean the blake 14 percent guinness <laughs> ipa pig destroyer to your face beer okay <laughs> it means the like not just not to not throw blake under the bus but i love to give him shit dude especially on camera it's my favorite uh when he can't defend himself it's funny though no i, I can't defend him because I, I had him on and he he doesn't like the heavy ABV, abv beers he always gets roped into them by the breweries listen the dude comes over and he pounds Guinness. He loves Guinness. Exactly. You know, he likes Guinness the way uh, I like six or seven Coors Lights. You know what I mean? Like this, dude. but anyway, <laughs> uh, DC Brow. So um, we, we're like, let's design a beer, okay? 
And we told them we wanted a light, move like drinkable, uh, heavy metal beer. You can have a couple at a show while you're watching a band. You can get a buzz, but you don't have that gut punch feeling uh, of like the heavy alcohol taste that comes with like a 12% alcohol or whatever the fuck they're doing now. You don't have that back of the head headache that comes with a super heavy beer after you drink too many because you like the taste of it, right? So when we were trying to figure out what kind of beer, we stumbled upon the Helles style, which mm -hmm. is a light German style beer, which uh, although um, America has the best marijuana, Germany may have some of the best beer. I mean, mm -hmm. they might have the best beer. I mean, I'm trying to think about it. And the thing is when you travel in Europe, and you drink beer every day, you, um, this is somebody people might not realize, like you're, you're given every style of beer. Like you, you travel and what happens is we roll up and we're like, hey, we need four cases of beer for the bus. Mm -hmm. well, they don't wanna give us fucking Coors Light because that's four cases that came all the way to America. They wanna give us the local beer. Exactly. And so in the best way possible, we get hooked up because you get to taste beer made with real water Mm -hmm. you know that crisp real feeling and you get to see that beer has a bad rep as a beverage because it it doesn't make people sick the way it can if it's brewed correctly with real ingredients like any other fucking thing that's made right so real beer made with simple ingredients done right will get you drunk but won't fuck you up in a bunch of other ways that this bullshit beer that everybody's drinking you know from the u.s will so Hellas seemed to make sense because we had tried a lot of different things. We knew what it was. We knew how light it was, but we didn't know how that would transfer to the way DC Brow brewed it because they had never brewed a Hellas. So uh, they went and they got the hops that they needed, which was super cool. It was a big fucking just goddamn. It was crazy. It was a big, 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 big vat of will look like weed bud even though it wasn't that was the fresh flower that's amazing and it smelled like the beer tasted in the end but we didn't know that but it's that's what i'm telling like it smelled distinctive and that smell was what the beer tasted like in the end so uh we were able to dump it in the into the hopper or whatever the fuck it's called you know that was sick film that really did it and then we went and got drunk in the brewery or whatever and came back like six weeks later and got to try it or whatever maybe it was longer i don't remember how long they brewed it for it took a minute and it was it was good now the damn the can looked good the, mm -hmm. the marketing looked good and everybody around town was excited that darkest hour had partnered with them that was two known brands or whatever uh but but it 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 tasted really good, and we did a record release show where they uh, brought in kegs of the beer, and um, it really worked. Like I drank three or four on stage, you know what I mean, and it just felt good, and um, it it really translated well. It would have translated well much better in can uh, bottles, but um, it was a huge success, and so then we did a bigger ex expanded. Uh, brew if you will and we then took that to uh, be sold regionally through DC Brow's marketing uh, system and the funny reason that I bring that up is I wanted to mention that there's an awesome video going around that you can find on YouTube of me playing a eruption and slamming a beer at the marketing meeting because there's a local brewery marketing meeting like thing for all the people that buy the alcohol and distribute it regionally that happens like once a month as the new beers come out and uh people tend to put funny snappy presentations together and give all the buyers little samples well we went in there and we rocked uh, brought in an amp just cranked that shit up to 10 at like nine in the morning i rocked eruption for them on a table and then slammed the beer <laughs> and uh, you know, definitely sold every case of beer that Amazing. day I was probably that the beer tasted good, but I think it had something to do with the shock and awe of eruption. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that video, DC Brow did an awesome edit of, uh, and it was really cool. Like they really were like, yeah. And they snuck me in the back uh, of this building and I had a little, a combo amp and I had it all set up on wheels and I had just one long, long extension cord, like a 50 foot extension cord. And I got there like 
two hours early and duct taped everything I needed to do eruption like sick. I'm talking about the phaser pedal, the delay pedal, the, the verb pedal. Like I got it all tuned in. I warmed up too, cause I knew they were gonna film it. And we just pushed this whole amp in there, rolled in there and it was like awesome. They really were surprised. And uh, that was like, spoke to the heart of the whole thing we did with them. You know, we did multiple shows where they brought in the beer and uh, in the end we couldn't have been happier. I mean, you know, you just, all good things have to end. So the beer is not a staple of the DC Brow brand, but I think that has a lot more to do with that. You know, expanding uh, another flavor is just a hard thing to do for a brewery on a normal scale. You know what I mean? No, but it's also cool for it to be there and then be gone. And then it could yeah. hypothetically come back and then people would be hyped up on it. Um, listen, I'm going to say it publicly. If DZ Brow just wants to make a hell of take our goddamn art off there, I just want to drink that shit again. <laughs> but I do like money. <laughs> it helps. It helps. Let's wrap this up with a classic Vox and Hops wrap-up question. Uh, it probably didn't happen to you until you were 30 years old because you didn't drink. But uh, it probably happened a few times after that. What is your hangover cure? Well, I don't, I try not to get hung over anymore. Okay. I just want to point that point that like, I haven't been hung over in a long time because I, I think uh, it's not good. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? No. Uh, but uh, it does happen. And it does happen as we mentioned with these like high velocity, heavy beers, it can sneak up on you, you know? Um, also, if you're like mixing beer and marijuana or something or beer in a vape pen, there's a lot of things that can happen as far as a hangover. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, I obviously number one trick is drink water. Everybody knows drink water. You know, if you're feeling like, damn, I'm hungover. Uh, those of you who are like me, uh, that, uh, are not afraid and are super into it. You can throw up, you know, throwing up is an awesome hangover cure that occasionally needs to happen, uh, when there is nothing else because getting whatever's out of you. Sometimes, let's just say you're really hungover. Mm -hmm. Suck about like you maybe drank way too much. You shouldn't have drank. If you gotta throw up, don't hold it in. Is where I'm getting at. So mm -hmm. number two on my list of things you gotta do is throw up. If you gotta throw up, don't hate the player, hate the game. If you're sick, you're sick. Just don't throw up in the bus bathroom. Take it outside, man. Fuck no. Don't throw up in front of a cop or a border no. guard. No. Okay, which has happened, Bales yes. Maya. Do not throw up right in front of the, I'm talking to you, Vail Maya. No. Uh, so don't, so throw up if you got to throw up, but don't throw up in front of a border guard. Drink water. Okay. Um, also, my hangover food of choice is pho. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard the, the Although I am trying to be, you know, trying to kick it vegetarian to save the whales. So, uh, you know, if you got a vegetarian pho option, but man, if I'm hungover, I might have to say, go for it. But pho, noodles. If y'all don't know what I mean, Google it. P H O. That's right. That is what I'm talking about. Also, uh, shout out to Powerade, Gatorade. You know, get your electrolytes up. I'm not into mixing powders into waters. People do that shit. But if I need to drink something, you know, I want to shout out to the to the to the energy drinks. So just to recap, before I get to you know where my number one secret. Uh, well, I got two more, but it's drink water, throw up if you got to throw up uh shit what was the, the other one that i just said power aids oh yeah power aids and then um the other one is second to last is coca-cola mm. i mean sometimes like a little sugar uh, the problem is you might be hungry if you're hungover so mm -hmm. you know um shit i'm gonna have to add two more because i forgot about smoking weed like if you're super hungover i thought that, I thought that was gonna be number one no because uh <laughs> number one is drink more yeah, that's the slippery Number slope. one is just keep drinking. But um, <laughs> yeah, that one, I don't know, man. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I try to avoid all up to, you know, this is a sliding scale. So if you're up to, if you get up to trying to medicate your head, your head if, you're, if you get up to trying to like medicate your hangover with a bong rip, then you ought to probably drink way too much. Mm -hmm. I pull that back. <laughs> Although I'm not trying to tell you what to do because there are guys in Darkest Hour who would be pissed off that I'm telling anyone what to do. Because there are first rules, there are no rules. You get fucked up. I mean, just you got to be able to play. Maybe that's a rule, but 
<laughs> that's been broken before so <laughs> uh those are my hips man i don't think there's anything revolutionary in there amazing and i don't try to make it a habit but uh, the throwing the throwing up is the first i haven't done that one for no one has said throw up if you need to throw up they must not have been really hung over <laughs> mike thank you so so much for taking the time having a chat with me about life metal and about craft beer I had a blast. Everyone get ready for this new Zealot RIP. Sign up to that Darkest Hour Patreon. Uh, yeah, we got a new you, record coming too, man. Darkest I'm Hour, excited. Zealot, all that shit. See Cheers. you all at the bar. If you ever see any of those bands, I'll see you motherfuckers at the bar. You buy ja a shot of Jack Daniels, then you can get a beer. We can wash the beer back. But I'll, that's what I'll see. <laughs> Cheers. Man. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you all so so much for listening right to the end you know that i love and appreciate that i had an excellent conversation with mike uh what a fantastic podcast guest i told him afterwards and he was like Ma, of course i'm a professional but it's true he is a great podcast guest uh so many stories stories that interlace into other stories a true pleasure to sit down and just listen to speak i've been a big fan of darkest hour for many years now so this was one for the books i was stoked when i booked it and i was even more stoked while i had the conversation so huge shout out to mike can't wait till we can hook up again and drink a few more brews and i can just listen to you speak some more because i absolutely love that if you enjoyed this vox and hops episode you should sign up to the vox and hops metal podcasts mailing list you can do that on my website voxandhops.com that's v-o-x-a-n-d-h-o-p-s.com and when you do that you shall receive one email a week containing all of the details of everything that is happening in the world of the vox and hops metal podcast including all of the details for any episodes which i have dropped throughout that past week if i've been a guest on someone else's podcast you get a sneak peek at the future episodes which will be coming out throughout the following week you can also hear about any details for any cool projects that i have in the works there are the links to the upcoming thirsty thursday virtual hangs as well as the links to the brutal awakenings playlist which is available on both apple music and spotify and is curated by my man jerry monk the metal architect himself do yourself a favor and do me a favor sign up to the vox and hops metal podcast mail list because i don't want you to miss a single thing there's so much going on in the world of the vox and hops metal podcast right now i would hate for you to blink and to miss something so sign up to the mailing list the vox and hops metal podcast is brought to you by sound talent media i have one more episode coming up on friday but until then remember to enjoy life metal and craft beer cheers vox and hops hits oh,